You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. Check, check, one, two. Look like a little country. Some rock and roll and blues. Cause we show sure love playing for good people like you. Let me know if you can hear me Check, check, one, two Welcome to Music Local and Sustainable, the radio show that features discussions with and the music of local musicians. I am your host, Dave Lake. Tonight we have on the show Greg Williams, internationally known singer and songwriter who has toured with John Mayer, Lyle Lovett, Bonnie Raitt, the Indigo Girls, and the late great Warren Zevon, among many others. But he is now back home here in Savannah, Georgia. Welcome, Greg Williams. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for having me on. In listening to your music, I get distinct folk on some songs, folk rock on others, straight ahead rock and roll, blues. How would you classify yourself? Roots rock, the best of Americana influences. Hank Williams, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, but moreover Robert Johnson, Muddy Waters. I've always been sort of a chameleon, but I think I tie it together. I love great songs. I love Bob Marley like I love Bob Dylan. Great melodies. That's what it, We're all trying to catch up to those guys. We never will, but we keep trying. It sounds like you have a wide range of inspirations. Is there any particular artist who inspires you as a performer? I'd have to mention Bob Dylan and, and also people like Neil Young and again the, the great classic Hank Williams especially as a, as a writer I don't know of any greater melodic writer than Hank Williams and his work has been interpreted in so many different ways by so many different artists I always say I play two kinds of songs I play the songs I wrote and the songs I wish I wrote Hank Williams has that melodic sense that you really would want in your own writing. What do you what do you see from Bob Dylan? Bob Dylan, someone asked him once in the 80s about what he thought of that current batch of new songwriters, people like Tracy Chapman and Suzanne Vega. He's known for being very outspoken, and that's another big influence that he has on me because he, he speaks his mind, but he says... Well, those people aren't, aren't really folk singers. A folk singer used to learn as many songs as he could and take them from town to town and spread that message and then also write with using those songs as a format. So Bob Dylan turned on so many of us to Woody Guthrie, but also Lead Belly, and a lot of the influences that he has are now my influences, and I pick them up through him. So he's the consummate troubadour and the consummate artist. I've always thought of people involved in film and people involved as artists, as, as painters and different mediums in that expression as we're all related. We all just use different palettes at different times. So to me, he's, he's all the colors in the rainbow as a writer. And as a performer, he's just as likely to come out with a guitar and play you a song as he is with a band. And you don't know what he's going to do. He's going to mix it up. And to not be boring is about the best thing you can do as an artist, I think. And what about Neil Young? Almost the same things I could say about Dylan, I could say about Neil Young. There's a lot of things these artists do with their lives. With some of the charities, one child has, I think, cystic fibrosis or something, but he's been involved in just a ton of charities for for more than 30 years and trying to help people instead of just sitting on a tall mill in a cash and going out and saying I'm Neil Young he's like hey what can I do to help I mean what's cooler than that yeah absolutely wish I could be that kind of hero that's the kind of guy I want to be you know and the kind of artist I want to be I've listened a lot to his music and really love his music but a while back I saw him on Colbert and I was amazed how personable he is they did some joking around, and he seems like a really nice guy. And he saved Lionel Trains 
few years ago, a lot of people don't know this, but Lionel Trains, the trains were all played with on the floor as kids. They almost went out of business, and he heard about it, so he bought the company. How much cooler do you need to be? Could that be the origin of the song Mourn for the Train? Is that one of yours? Yes, that's one of my songs. It's it's more about a mourn as in mourning for the train of thought that someone is going through. That song is about addiction. Mm. But it's not about mourning addiction. It's about turn it up and let's go faster. It's it's kind of a destructive anthem. But I enjoyed writing it. <laughs> I enjoyed living it. I try not to anymore, but I sure did that time. That song is autobiographical? Yeah, most things are one way or another. Some things are not, but, but that's one that is. Uh, there's a number of songs on most of my records. I've done five albums before I signed with Cherry Lane Music Publishing, and now I'm with BMG. It's something that says that people are hearing my music in places like Germany and Portugal, and, and I've had songs and, and movies and TV shows all over. And I mean, you want people to hear your work. What, what artist doesn't want to be heard or seen? That, that's really one of the great things about a lot of the online services now, the digital services, because they can take a song and who knows where that song is. Yeah, we, we get these statements quarterly. That's how it works. When you're published, you get a, a quarterly statement, and then you get this online thing that you can check if you're a real mascus and see how little you're actually making. <laughs> but you get these things and... Oh, well, they really dig my work in, in Spain. They really dig my, my, my work in Portugal, but I, I don't speak Portuguese, and I've never been to Spain. I'll, I'll take it. Thanks. I guess you wonder, what about your music is attractive to those particular countries? I try to be honest. and uh, I think people can feel things more than they hear and they see and they overlook their, their, uh, their vibe detector sometimes. But I think that's the truest sense of knowing someone. It's the feeling you get about them. If you just sort of take a breath and sort of absorb things. I know that's what I enjoy most about my two favorite people in my life are are my daughter, Rowan, who's nine, just about to be ten, and my mom. They that is the purest feeling of love and just I'm comfortable with them. That's I'm just grateful for them. That's home. In the past, you've traveled a lot. You've been to a lot of different places, and you worked regularly in Nashville? Well, Nashville wasn't so much of a job experience. It's just various trips to play well-known hubs like the Bluebird Cafe. And I recorded my first album, I think it was 92, at a place called The Castle in Franklin, Tennessee, which is actually a castle right outside of Nashville. And Nashville's cool because even when you're down in that big hub, Tootsies or whatever, you drive for 10 minutes and there's cows out there. You know, you're out in the country. So lots lots of travels there. Never really lived there. I just I would go back and forth there and then lived off and on in Atlanta. And then my first tour, which was, uh, I guess, 93, 94, with Great White, which is a big heavy metal band. They had you know, a bunch of platinum records, and that was like rock and roll college for me. That was the first time I was ever on a tour bus. That was the first time I was out with them for like five months or something, and we went all the way up to Toronto and then all the way to L.A., just up and down, zigzagging across the country. And that's a that's a road movie or a miniseries in itself, some of the things that happened on that tour. I guess the tour manager during that time had some sort of recurring meth addiction and left with something like $30,000 in a leather briefcase. They never saw him again. That was one experience. And, uh, of course, there were a lot of great theater shows on that tour. The Metropolitan Theater in Spokane is a really old classic theater, very grandiose, kind of like kind of like the Lucas here in town, maybe even a little older than that. And that was one of my favorite places. And then came back here for a while, made another record or two, and I was playing acoustic gigs I play a lot of my own music and sell my records and and turn people onto my site and turn them on to bigger shows like the shows at the Tybee Post Theater where I love what they're doing out there I love what Melissa's put together out there and uh, and Dante I think it's just a, an amazing opportunity to go and and hear a show I like the environment I like the sound they're doing a great job 
But a lot of the, the traveling I've done has taught me a lot of different things. But I was down at, at Yui's doing all these tourist gigs, and the people with Don Buckwalt, who were in town with Nickelodeon, and that was around the time of Britney Spears. So she was a you know, Mickey Mouse Club Nickelodeon person too at that time. And they signed me. And then the next two or three years were spending, you know, a couple of months here, a couple of months in there, working with Don Buckwald, who still managed uh, Howard Stern and do all his business. And that's where I met a lot of Neil Young's people, Kiki Whitman, Kiki Wow, she goes by out there. She was with Warner Brothers, and I was working with her, and uh, and she was Neil Young's right-hand person for a number of years. Neil only works with one guy at a time, apparently, because he's used to, you know, he's been ripped off like Joni, Joni Mitchell. I'm surprised I haven't mentioned Joni Mitchell before now. Oh, hail Joni. What are some of the other experiences that you've had on the road? That first tour, I had been playing in Savannah, and I went to play a gig in Hilton Head, South Carolina, at a place called the Big Dog Grill. And it was in Caligny Square at the end of the island. And it was a late gig. It started at 2 and went to 5 in the morning. So, because there were kids around, everybody's on vacation. I guess they don't sleep over there. I know how they are. I don't sleep very much either. But um, this beautiful girl walks in. Green eyes. She's gorgeous. And I had a girlfriend at the time. But uh, I was getting ready to kind of get out of that because it was getting serious. And I was scared about that. So I met this girl. And we went for a walk that night. And two weeks later, we got married. And she was the third initiate high priestess. She was one of the youngest witches in the country at the time. We stayed married for about six months. Everything went great until we put our clothes on, and then it all went downhill. But what I was saying about that is that uh, during that period is when I did an opening show with the heavy metal band, Great White, and, and then they called me back. And things were very rough, and I was like, get me out of here. And Jack Russell called me up and asked me to go on tour with them. So that was the next five months of my life. And then I came home and got the big D. There was one, one occasion she joined me in, in Charlotte and had been trailed by somebody else in a pickup truck, hollering at her to pull over all the way until she got to somewhere in North Carolina where I was, scared to death. That guy's following me. And of course, you got to look at all of us hoodlums, and he turned around and ran away. He was some little redneck. But that, it's, there's, been, there's been a lot of stuff. I don't know. I, there's a lot. You know, like Lennon says, life's what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. It, it seems strange. Your music can be really good rock and roll, but I think it more blues, more Americana, more more subtle than would be seemingly paired with a metal rock band. Yeah, well, I, I thought that too. At the time, I mean, I've opened for Taylor Dane, for her and, and, and this John Mayer and recorded with Sean Mullins. The Eddie's Attic scene, which is where I met Sean Mullins and John Mayer, and that's in a Decatur of the Atlanta area. Eddie Owen runs that place, and he not only introduced me to a lot of great players, and put me on stage with them. I'm learning from all the experiences they've had and all the performing things that they've learned from. I'm able to watch them put all that together and then borrow from that and then build on my own performing. When you work with the best, you get better. You feel silly because, wow, you know, you're so much more comfortable than I am. And then you get comfortable because you work with them. But John Mayer and Sean Mullins and the Indigo Girls and Warren Zevon was the first major writer that I ever played with at Congress Street Station. It's something different, it changes a lot. But, and that was amazing because I got to actually hang out with him. He drives in on a bus. I was familiar with some of his songs, but in the years after that, and after opening for him and watching him do songs like Rolling the Headless Thompson Gunner and Desperados Under the Eaves, which is my favorite Warren Z1 song, Lawyers, Guns, and Money, which apparently was stuck to his head. Napkin stuck to his head after he passed out in Key West on a bar. He woke up and he's like, oh, okay, that's that's a good idea, you know. That, that's Because he's Hemingway drunk, it's his deal. But when I met him, he wasn't he wasn't the, the crazed Warren Zevon that we read about in, in the books. 
was really just into his music. It was a solo tour with him, a piano and a guitar. And just, we talked about, of all things, Peter and Gordon. Peter Asher, who became the very successful manager of people like Linda Ronstadt and, and the whole, Cal we call them the California Mafia, like the original Session 70s guys, Leland Sklar, a big bass player who played with James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt and plays with the, the Christopher Guest crew a lot now. And just, just this amazing, talented group of people. But I wanted to know about Peter Asher, and he, and he seemed very perplexed and interested because he and Peter have always had kind of a rocky road, I guess. I found out later, mostly because of all his partying. He he was he was a cool guy. He was he was a really cool guy and and at that time I only had like an inkling of of some of the great songs that he had written, you know, Splendid Isolation, these kind of songs. I I think a great song sort of says what we're all feeling. It's just the way they condense you know, a great writer can condense those feelings. Is that what you try to do in your songs? Yes. Sort of condense feelings down. Communication. I mean I I, I love poetry. I'd love to take you somewhere that you haven't been and remind you of a place you'd like to go back to. It's so tempting to get melancholy at times, but reflection is slowing down. You think about things more. But it also can make you appreciate living in the moment, too. The old vaudeville line that's always stuck with me since I, write, I started writing was, Don't bore us, get to the chorus. Right, which to me doesn't mean that every song has to be like, she loves you and do the chorus first. What it means is there's strength and brevity. Keep it simple. Even if just a combination of words make you feel something. Every day there's different things that, that I've read or learned or listened to that have inspired me to write further. One of my, my favorite lines in a, in a Bob Dylan song is from uh, Simple Twist of Fate, where he says, People tell me it's a sin to know and feel too much within. I still believe she was my twin, but I lost the ring. She was born in spring, but I was born too late. Blame it on a simple twist of fate. And that's a painting. I aspire all my songs to sound as good as that one verse sounds. It blows me away. That's Yeah, that's what I want to do. Let's talk about Darkness is a Big Wheel. What was the inspiration of that song? I always tell people on stage that I really loved my big wheel when I was a kid. You ride around, you know, you skid, you do those 360s on the, on the street with the big wheel. But I realized that one day I would be 6'3", and a very large dude. So I got too big for the big wheel. And it made me sad. Uh, darkness. Darkness is a big wheel. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's really based on people say bad things happen in threes. And once the ball starts rolling, it's hard to stop it. Sometimes one bad thing can justify another bad thing. Darkness in terms of maybe self-destructive tendencies. But also, hopefully, redemption. But you know, I've only known a couple people who had some, some real serious sort of psychological addiction kind of problems and and they were whoppers they were enough and a lot of the songs that I've written at different times are, are reflective of some of their struggles and some of my own struggles but I think a lot of I don't know about yours but a lot of mine are, are inner psychological choices and the results of the choices that you made or that you didn't make mostly the things that you didn't do mostly the conflicts that you didn't involve yourself in are the things that stick in your mind more than the mistakes for me, I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but if you listen to the song, it's a minor sort of a melody. And then in the chorus, it blossoms. It's like a flower that blossoms into this G major kind of in a dream. Everything is beautiful. Everything is strange. And it's so much better than where you came from, especially if you were in the first part of the song where you were contemplating the things that weren't so good.
But no matter who you are, darkness is a big wheel. It starts rolling and roll over you, and it's really hard to stop it sometimes. That's why some people don't come out of it. That's why suicide is not necessarily a selfish choice for everyone. Some people really feel like they'd be better off without you. They're not trying to, to hurt you, and they certainly don't mean to be selfish. They think they're being magnanimous by getting out of your life and out of your way so that you won't worry about them. And I think that's a, a very serious issue in America, too, because it's been growing. You know, the side thing, it's always, it's always been part of our civilization, but it's growing. People who are not happy are extremely not happy. Let's, let's trace your musical journey. How did music begin in your life? My grandfather, my mother's father, was the son of a, a sharecropper. So he picked a lot of cotton in his life, and he played the auto harp, mostly church songs. Married my grandmother really young. He was like 19, she was 16. They're from up around the way, across Georgia area. And he'd play the auto harp on his lap. Some people play it like Mother Maybell on their shoulder, but he played it on his lap like this. Just a lot of those songs stuck with me, and as soon as I could start playing I wanted to play and then we would be in being a really really little boy and seeing like my mom and dad always had like you know the Glenn Campbell and Johnny Cash show those kind of things were just it seemed like everybody loved those guys and it was just magical what they were doing I mean Johnny never did a whole lot of intricate picking he just was Johnny Cash and then Glenn Campbell just seemed to be grinning all the time he has some serious health issues now but if you grew up and you're my age or your age, you remember what a genius this guy always has been on the guitar. I mean, he used to understudy for Chet Atkins and Jerry Reed, some of the finest American guitar players ever to take a breath. Just shocking how good they are. But that and another thing, I never went to church a whole lot, but my mom is of a faith called a, a primitive Baptist. They believe in things like predestination and and I try to understand a lot of that stuff, but I just have to have the best relationship I have otherwise with with the big G. But one of the things I remember seeing that influenced me, and I remember two years later that really influenced me, is their pastor. His name was Roy Sims, and he had a gas station by day, but he was a very, very inspired with the Spirit. Almost like a fire and brimstone kind of a preacher. And he'd get up on this wooden pulpit, and you'd hear it go. And he'd be reading from the Word, and he'd be preaching. He wouldn't do much with his arms, but I mean, he'd be cracking a sweat, and it'd be rhythmic. It would be. And he'd be looking everybody right in the eye. It was like, he was like lifted, man. You know, his feet didn't touch the ground sometimes. And that was inspirational to me in rock and roll because that's what you want. You want to be so taken away from it that you're not an observer. It's Unless you're an observer like someone in a hospital room above their body looking, you're watching. And I've, I've experienced that a few times, playing some of the better bands that I've, I've had over the years and some of the better shows that I've had over the years when everybody is like, I prefer, myself, I prefer medium size or small clubs. I like, you know, I like the small theaters. The smaller club, like the Bayou Cafe downtown, you know, I play there quite a bit. And I do a lot of acoustic shows there, but some of the nights when people are packed in there, and the air is pumping, but it's still kind of a sweaty feeling to be pumped in there, and everybody's got the spirit of it, and people are really on the nose, you're watching the show, and then you're lifted up by the spirit of everybody kind of digging it's it's crazy it's a crazy feeling it's like a transcendence yes that communication between the audience and the performer transcends both groups yes yes and you're together you won you get absolutely right well put absolutely right communication that's to me why live music is so important is that communication between the artist and the audience it's like we're making the painting together. Like we're all, we're all part of the canvas and we're all making this. We're all making this thing, all this oxygen and all this 
these chemicals are all making this brew together. Yeah, absolutely. So you started from this initial experience that you had in the church. Well, where did you take it after that? I started taking some lessons in the 70s. There was a store called Schroeder's. The elder, Mr. Schroeder, was a five-string banjo player. But he knew guitar, and he taught me a lot. He was a little cynical, but he was an older guy. You know, at the time, he was, you know, 65 or something, but but very talented and, and taught me a lot of stuff. He was kind to me. For a few years, I did that, and then I started with my first bands around 14, 15, and then started playing some public gigs around 15 or 16, and learned a lot more, a lot faster from professional stage musicians that I had learned ever before, because it's a sink or swim thing, and you have to be able to perform on the dot. You have to show up, you have to be there, you have to know your material, and you have to... And what you don't know, you have to be able to wing it with a smile on your face and not stop in the middle. And, oh, I must have. Yeah. It's, it's like that part of it is just like being an actor. You have to keep on. So uh, and then and then uh, after a lot of those gigs uh, in writing, another professional musician, a guy named John Lilly, he's a bluegrass player that's up in West Virginia. Now, I don't really play bluegrass, but we shared a lot of common ground with the love of the writing of people like Jimmy Rogers and, of course, Hank Williams. He took me under his wing a little bit, and I recorded that first record in Nashville. And then uh, a few years after that, started working with some guys who were in a band called City of Linda's. They were super popular here in town. Jim Reed was the drummer, and Kevin Rose, who has Elevated Basement out on the Duran, a great guitar player. Started working with them, and, and uh, we... They were doing a record with Phil Hadaway here in town, and he's a great engineer, and, and we started working on an album, and then I, by that time I was really ensconced with the Atlanta music scene and built on all that folk stuff. But the, the reason I didn't completely fit in with that scene is because it was so extremely folky. And like I say, my, my music is kind of schizophrenic. I love the folk, and I love the blues, but just as much I love psychedelic acid rock. I like country music, like older country music a lot. I, I guess, like I say, the best way to tie it together is roots rock. Soul. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. If you enjoy the programming on WRUULP, Please support the station with a donation. Basic memberships begin at only $50. Additional membership levels are available. And monthly or recurring donations are welcome as well. To check out our membership rates and to donate to the station, go to www.wruu.org individual and select your preferred donation level. Again, to donate to the station, Go to www.wruu.org slash individual. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUULP. You're listening to Music Local and Sustainable, and I'm your host, Dave Lake. Tonight we're talking with Greg Williams, well-known singer-songwriter here in Savannah. Let's talk about Monster Movie. What's the origin of Monster Movie? I'm a big fan of universal horror movies, the classics, Bela Lugosi and Lon Chaney Jr., Boris Karloff. I first saw him in a movie called The Black Cat with Bela Lugosi. Fix my face. I love those old monster movies, you know? And they they did scare me at the time, but the older I've gotten, I just just dig them for the vibe. You wonder what happened to some of the props in those films. You just want them in your house. I think it's cool, that big giant ray gun thing. But I was in a relationship with my daughter's mother that lasted about 11 years through a lot of ups and downs and a lot of travels. And that song was written for her. It was kind of like the music business, my background with my family, these things are are somewhat monstrous at times. And I'm just going to be honest with you, it's not going to be easy. But I love you, 
and I, I want us to be together. So uh, be in my monster movie, kind of like an invitation thing. But I also sort of thought about it like uh, King Kong with a little blonde girl, a little fairy, egg, you know. He's basically saying, I really dig it, you know. But... At the time, I thought of myself as being the big ape with the little blonde girl. But it turns out she was the big ape, and I'm the little blonde girl. So. that are played by each individual are not necessarily what we expect. Absolutely. I'd say mostly not. (laughs) We're all not just a pawn in their game. We're a pawn in our game. Blake said, uh, the eyes are the windows to the soul. I think maybe 
there's some mirrors going on and we're we're getting we're getting we're sending ourselves the wrong signal sometimes and I I can't figure out why the reason for that is but I know that I've done it more than once. And then as you said before, we have to deal with the decisions we make and then the decisions we don't make. Yeah. And the things that we do, but we also have to be aware of the things we don't do. Yeah. And I've tried to not be too careful, but who knows? Maybe I should have been more careful occasionally. <laughs> and you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, I certainly wasn't planning on being a father. I thought uh, the sort of focus you have to have to, to, at least I had to have, to get to be able to let my feelings flow enough to to compose and to present that to people and to put my business on front street. I didn't think that would be conducive towards fatherhood. And also, I didn't get along with my father. I mean, like a lot. I, I can't get in, far enough into it. We just didn't get along. But it turns out my daughter is the song I always wanted to write. She is the best thing that I can't even, I can't even thank God enough. It's just, there's no way to even say it. I'm, I'm glad that, he, I'm glad that she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so one of your other songs, uh, The River's My Brothers, that, that's one of my favorites. It really says a lot. Um, could you, could you talk about the origin of that? Right. Uh, I guess my dad was three quarters Cree. And, and we're whatever that is, the next generation of that. And my brother, Randy, passed this last September, but he lived among the trees. He worked with Asplund all those years, and he was made a lot of leather goods and was very, very much into the Native side of things. There's always some sort of Native American song. Just on just about all the records, there's some reference to that. In my first album, I had a song called Spirit, which is about the great spirit, and Relativity was the album that, Rivers My Brother comes off of. And we also got a really big Roger McGuinn kind of sound. I was experimenting a lot with the, the Rickenbacker 12 string through the Vox AC30, being a, a big fan of like Beatles and Stones and Yardbirds and trying to, to get those kind of tones. And I think we succeeded on that. It's a very bouncy, upbeat, kind of jangly thing. But lyrically, it, it owes a lot to a speech by Chief Seattle. I quote lines from that. It's public domain and then I add things to that and I sort of arrange it and that's what really makes that a traditional folk rock song in the vein of say you know Joni or Crosby Stills Nash and Young because they they were taking folk traditions and then adding modern twists to the folk tradition and that that song almost sounds like it could have come out in 71 or 72 except for the, the production values are even higher than some of that stuff. We just, I think we made a good record that has Jim Reed on the drums and uh, and Kevin Rose on the guitar and Phil's playing the bass and the organ and I'm playing everything else and singing it and I wrote all of it. So uh, I'm very proud of that. But but yeah, it's, it's a definite commentary on uh, your value system and ecology and, and politics, really. Politics shouldn't be the cause. Greed shouldn't be a, a reason to sacrifice things that we're all entitled to enjoy. And I know that there's all kinds of compromises being made. I just don't necessarily think that should be one of them. There's definitely areas that you're not allowed to go and build a hotel in. If you decided you wanted to go to Yellowstone National Park and build a high-rise, they wouldn't really let you do that. Black Hills of South Dakota, even though... We know that was supposed to be protected and it was still invaded for gold, you know. Um, I think our natural resources are, are pretty important, don't you? I mean, yeah. yeah. I think that's why I like it so much because it speaks to a great faith in the environment and how the environment is so important to us and spiritual. Thank you for pointing out. I, I, I like the idea of, of singing at the top of my lungs. If you spit on the ground, you spit on yourself. That says a lot. That's that's probably the T-shirt for that song. It's like, hey, what's wrong with you? I mean, come on. The only thing is, it's like my my dad and your dad would say, well, that should be common sense. But common sense is not necessarily common. When a major fabric manufacturer poisons the Ogeechee River, 
it's not common sense, apparently. I used to do a comic strip in the 90s, like a one-panel Gary Larson-style comic that was published in a paper called Charleston's Free Time. And I did a cartoon once about the Savannah River plant. And it was these two figures, these two guys, you could see they were in suits, but they were like skeletons, <laughs> and they were glowing, and they were standing in front of the reactors, you know, big reactors, and, it's, and it said, we at the Savannah River plant want to assure you of the total safety of our facility. <laughs> it was just like a stirred up. But I think we got all right. We should say things that matter. If anybody's going to be listening to this, I hope they take something meaningful from the songs because they mean a whole lot to a lot of us, me and and everybody we've talked about today. But I think there's a lot of important issues like the environment that we should stand up for because we're not going to be here forever. We owe it to the children. Absolutely. To preserve an environment that is safe to live in. Yeah, absolutely. And we haven't been doing a very good job. Yeah. Well, we got to try harder. Yeah. One of my favorites from the Caterpillar album is You Were In My Dream. Tell me a little bit about that. That song is about my grandfather not being extremely close to my father for, I mean, for various reasons. I'm not, he wasn't exactly Simon Legree or anything, but he had his moments, but he had a lot of problems himself. But my grandfather, my mother's father, was about the best example of a male role model that I I could think of. And I I miss him a lot. I spent a lot of time with him growing up. He passed away of cancer many years ago. I mean, all the things that you would normally do, a lot of with your dad, fishing and messed around. I mean, there were a lot of grandchildren in the family. And he, even in his 60s, he would get down in the middle of the floor and play with all of us. Just tickle you to death. You would quit before he did. He just had boundless energy for that because he loved the children so much. You know? But that song is about, the chorus of it is, you were in my dream, you were still alive. That's, I mean, that's the long and short of it. That's what it's about. It's about him. Yeah, it's a real, a real song of love. Yeah. Black heart Dark eye Sleep alone Every time you were in my dream last night, you closed the circle, you made it all right. I know, but no one else
it's too late to ever sway the hand of fate. I know you agree. That's the only thing that's clear to me. And you were in my dream last night. You closed the circle. You made it all right. I know what no one else knows. We shot video for that in Burbank. I haven't ever really released that video. We're working on a kind of a compilation record because I haven't released an album in a few years. Having done six all together, one's a completely traditional blues record, one is very folky and then the others are sort of a mixture of folk and rock and blues. I think we may be calling it Blacklight because I just dig Blacklight. <laughs> It'll be like a best of. Um, and have a few songs from each record and some, some bonus stuff, some stuff that hasn't come out. But I would, I would like to figure out a way that I could include like a DVD with um, one, of the, one of the videos we shot that's available on my site is, is for the song Milk, which is also from Caterpillar. And we shot that in West Hollywood. Uh, my friend Kurt Hall directed that. I told him I wanted it to be what I thought video film should have been back when MTV was first introduced and wasn't sort of the aberration that I think it is now. Then it, the idea was let's get some short films together with music. Not like a, a film of, of a bunch of guys dancing around in spandex. But the idea of, of putting film with, with these, these little four and a half minute films as long as the song. And that's what we did with this. We we made like this this little movie about this this girl going across town to see this guitar player. And it's West Hollywood. So you got all this Hollywood after dark stuff and all. The image is really interesting. You should check it out. It's something I'm more proud of. I'm, I was proud of the song, but I'm proud of the film too. Just a 
what's the, what's the origin of the song, Milk? It's sort of about a, someone that you don't think you're ever going to find. And sometimes you think you see part of that muse in other people, but it's kind of an elusive inspiration. I've always said that I thought people in this country or in the world in general were spiritually starving, but they really didn't know what they were hungry for. It's like you get up in the middle of the night and you're starving, you go to the refrigerator, but nothing looks good. It's like, oh man, I, but, I'm, but I'm hungry. So you like eat a cracker or, or drink a glass of milk and it puts you off the hunger for a few minutes. But this song is not really referring to the drink so much other than the way milk looks when it's poured on skin. You know, it's that sort of smooth, sort of rivulet kind of thing. And I lived with a, a ballerina for four or five years in my early 20s. And she was like that. And nothing meant more to her than for her movements to be fluid. For like from one form to the other, the way that she moved was, it was very liquid and very fluid. And she worked long and hard on that. Even when other parts of her life would fall apart, she could really do that very well from her head to her toe. So it kind of refers to that, too. Thank you very much for coming in this evening. We've had Greg Williams on the show, internationally known singer and songwriter, living here in Savannah and performing here in Savannah. And I just want to thank you so very much for coming in tonight. It's my pleasure anytime. I want to wish you a lot of luck with the program, and I hope it continues to expand. I've come and gone from the area quite a bit, and it seems to be different now than ever was. There's more opportunities to to play and to and to talk about your music and if you are someone who has sort of a an artistic background it's more of an opportunity now to work with others of a similar mind on both sides of the microphone and i wanted to say if there's anything i can do for you give me a holler Silly monkey, not a monkey, but a chimpanzee. Monkey, monkey, silly monkey, seed swinging from tree to tree. You must be brave to climb so high. You must be brave to touch the sky. He wants another banana. He wants another banana. All he's gotta do is ask. Monkey, monkey, silly monkey. Not a monkey, but a chimpanzee Monkey, monkey, silly monkey See him swinging from tree to tree He must be brave, climb so high He must be brave to touch the sky He wants another banana He wants another banana This has been another edition of Music Local and Sustainable, and I've been your host, Dave Lake. Save this time for another show next week. Well, I know we ain't headed for the Hall of Fame. We're gonna give it what we got, man, that ain't no shame. Let me know if you can hear me. Check, check, one, two. Let me know if you can hear me. Check, check, one.